Bon matin. Good morning, everybody. Je suis Graham Carr, président de la Fédération canadienne des sciences humaines, et il me fait très grand plaisir de vous accueillir ici ce matin pour ce causerie voix grand présenté par notre conférencier uh, Wendy Craig de l'Université Queen's. I'm very pleased to welcome you here this morning uh, to this uh, Big Thinking Lecture uh, presented by uh, Wendy Craig. As many of you know, I uh, recognize a number of faces in the crowd. Uh, the goal of these Big Thinking Lectures is really to connect the work that uh, arts, social science, and humanities researchers do with uh, public policy uh, makers people who have an interest in public policies uh, uh, that affect the uh, social, economic, uh, and cultural well-being of, uh, of Canadians. And much of the focus of the, uh, of the Big Thinking series is on topics such as the topic we'll be looking at this morning uh, that focus on problems and challenges for Canadian society. Et uh, dans ce contexte, c'est, c'est vraiment excellent de voir parmi nous ce matin uh, plusieurs uh, députés et sénateurs uh, qui viennent de, uh, de tous les coins de nos pays, uh, même uh, les représentants de, de, de milieux académiques uh, et uh, milieux universitaires et, uh, et les ONG. And I also want to thank uh, our colleagues from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada who are here today and uh, without whose support uh, much of the outstanding research in the social sciences and humanities would not be taking place in Canada. Let me introduce you now to our, uh, our speaker um, and say also that we are particularly pleased today to have partnered with the uh, Canadian Psychological Association and Karen Cohen, the uh, CEO of the Canadian Psychological Association, will be thanking Wendy uh, after the talk. I'd also like to uh, um, uh, acknowledge and uh, welcome uh, Daniel Wolf, the principal of my alma mater, Queen's University, uh, who is here uh, today as, as well. It's a delight to have you, Daniel, and uh, thank you for your institutional support uh, for the Federation. Wendy Craig is a professor in the Department of Psychology at uh, Queen's University. Queen's has one of the the leading uh, psychology departments in Canada. And she's done extensive research into bullying from a developmental psychopathology perspective. Her work extends, however, beyond research to program and policy applications, and and that's the reason why we've invited her here this morning. She is co-leader of the Promoting Relationships and Eliminating Violence Network, known as PREVNET. Dr. Craig has brought researchers, NGOs, and governments into dialogue around deepening our understanding and promoting mental and physical health, healthy relationships, and school engagement, and and is working to decrease the problem, the important problem of bullying in Canada. So please join me in welcoming Wendy Craig. Good morning, and I'd like to thank all of you for getting up and coming here so early in the morning. Um, uh, This is an early hour for me to give a a talk, but I'll try. The good news is that might make it brief. so today, I've, I've, the talk is titled Searching for Answers, Addressing Children, Bullying and Children's Health. And I'm going to start because in case I lose you in the 50 minutes I have so you can remember the take-home message. And my take-home message is in Canada, we have to do more to, to support children and to support youth. And the mechanism and the way to do it is to create policy programs and initiatives to support healthy relationships. And that's the argument, and that's the data that I'm going to introduce you a bit about today. So I want to start with giving you a little glimpse about how Canadian youth are doing um, in terms of their mental health um, and in terms of, of issues of violence like bullying. The Canada has a gem of a, re, of a, a data set called the Health Behavior Survey of Children and Youth. Um, it's fu- funded by Public Health Agency Canada. Uh, in the last round, we surveyed over 27,000 children across the country about various health behaviors and health issues. On this slide, I have a percentage of children who are reporting high levels of emotional problems. So these aren't diagnosable problems, but these are emotional problems, that they're reporting that they feel anxious or worried or depressed, um, that they can't sleep, 
Um, and what you should notice from this graph is two things. The girls are in red and the boys are in blue. More girls than boys at all grades through 6, 10 report higher levels of emotional problems. Um, and the emotional problems increase with age. So for girls, we go from 35% of girls reporting emotional problems in grade 6 to 44% in grade 10. That's an alarming increase. Uh, for boys, it's actually relatively stable. However, if when we ask them about behavior problems, that's about being aggressive, delinquent, um, talking back, being oppositional, stealing things. Um, these are the percentage of students who report, in the same example, high levels of behavioral problems. Here we see that with boys, there's an increase in grade, uh, an increase by grade in the problem behavior. So in grade six, 30% of boys are, are reporting a high level of these behavioral problems, and by grade 10, it's 48%. For girls, it starts at 27% in grade six and goes up to 45%. So the lesson here is, and I could put on many slides for many different kinds of behaviors, but really the story is the same. As children develop, they're increasing in their reported problem behaviors. One end of the continuum is when those behaviors, for a subset of children, those behaviors are going to turn into mental health problems. And we know now that the current statistic in Canada is that one in five Canadians will experience a mental health disorder in their lifetime. That's 20% of Canadians will experience that. What's important to know is about one in seven children experience mental health problems. And for those adults who have mental health problems, about half of those cases begin before age 14. My story here is we need to do a lot more for children and youth in order to prevent them from going on to have those mental health problems and in order to, to protect them from that very sensitive period before age 14 when they could develop those mental health problems. So what do we need to do? And I'm, one of the things I'm going to argue is relationships matter. There was a meta-analysis done recently, which is a summary of all of the studies in the field. And this meta-analysis found that they looked at literally data from over 310,000 individuals across the country, and these individuals across many different countries, excuse me, and these individuals had been followed over time. And what they found across all of these studies is that individuals with adequate social relationships had a 50% greater likelihood of survival compared to those who had poor social relationships. In other words, having positive relationships increases your, life, your, your ability to have better health throughout your lifespan. This effect is so big, it's bigger than the effects that's associated with mortality, mortality for smoking and for obesity um, and for uh, physical inactivity. These effects are bigger. So social relationships are, having poor social relationships are a greater risk factor for early mortality than the well-known ones that we read about all the time, smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. So social relationships are incredibly important. So how do our Canadian youth do on social relationships? Well, the Health Behavior Survey also gives us that information. On some very simple indices, we don't do very well, to be honest. On ease of communication with parents, Canada ranked in the bottom half of 38 countries. On the quality of relationships with classmates, do you have someone to talk to? Do you have someone that you feel that can support you? Canada ranked in the bottom third. On rates of bullying, uh, Canada ranked in the bottom half. And on rates of peer victimization, Canadian youth ranked in the bottom half. Clearly, we don't do well as a society in supporting our youth and helping them to develop healthy relationships. We recently com completed a small uh, project for the Public Health Agency Canada where we looked at the role of relationships as, as it predicted healthy outcomes. And so um, in the health behavior survey of children and youth. And so some of the outcomes that we looked at were physical health, the healthy lifestyle, emotional health, positive behaviors, aggressive behavior, substance use, risky behaviors, and academic achievement. We looked at how does the quality of relationships impact those health outcomes. And this is exactly my argument, and this is exactly what the, the meta-analysis showed you. 
Basically, relationships matter. For parent relationships, the quality of parent relationships was a significant predictor of, of positive outcomes with high quality relationships for 23 out of 24 of those things. So healthy relationships don't just predict uh, having uh, 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 not, not engaging in aggressive behavior or being pro-social, but it predicts your actual physical health, it predicts your mental health, it predicts your emotional health, it predicts your academic achievement. That relationship existed over and above, we were controlling for, so over and above the effects of socioeconomic status, over and above the effect of age, that parents, the quality, high quality of parents' relationships protected against negative outcomes, and they were associated with positive outcomes for 23 out of 24. Teacher relationships were related to eight out of the 24 relationships. They were predicted things like teacher, high quality teacher relationships predicted healthy eating, high quality of life, mental health well-being, pro-social behavior, and high academic achievement. School relationships. Are there adults in the school who care about you, that you can go, and that you can talk to, not necessarily your teacher? They, were, they were mattered for 13 out of those 24 uh, outcomes, things like they were protective against developing behavior problems or being victimized by peers or smoking or drinking. Um, they also were associated with uh, healthy eating and physical activity. Peer relationships mattered for 14 out of the 24 outcomes and your neighborhood relationships mattered for 12 out of the 24 outcomes. So did you have someone in your neighborhood that you could talk to? Did you, people in your neighborhood stop and uh, care about you or ask you how you were doing. My point is all kinds of relationships matter. All kinds of relationships pr promote well-being and protect us against the negative relationships uh, and negative outcomes. Here's an example of how it works. So if you look at this graph, as you're looking at it, uh, I'm having a left mo right moment. As you're looking at it, on the one side of the left-hand side is boys, the right-hand side is girls. In blue are the children who reported poor relationships. 53% of children who reported a poor relationship with parents reported high levels of emotional problems. 70% of girls. Compare that with 11% of boys who reported a positive relationship with their parents had emotional problems, and 16% of girls. Relationships matter. Here's another example. Same idea with teachers, only I flipped it around. This is emotional well-being. 58% of children who have a positive, high-quality relationship with their teacher report emotional well-being if you're a boy. 46% of girls. Relationships matter. And here's your peer relationship. 34% of boys who have a poor relationship with peers have emotional problems. 54% of girls compared to 21 who have positive relationships for boys and 30 for girls. Relationships matter. Normally I come out and talk a lot about bullying, but I'm only going to give it a second in this particular one because uh, it's an example of a negative relationship. It's an example of a destructive peer relationship. Um, bullying is where one child uses power and aggression to hurt another child, and that child who's being victimized is unable to defend themselves. We know from the literature that the most effective interventions are those that are relationship-based in dealing with bullying and victimization. They're, they deal with all of the relationships in the school. It's a whole school approach where you deal with the classroom, the, the school climate, the parents, and the most successful ones also involve the community. So bullying prevention, which is a relationship problem and requires relationship solutions, we know the most effective ways to deal with it are when we um, engage in relationship kinds of things. So in this first piece, I hope to Im sort of send you the message that the consequences of failing to protect our children and youth from violence and failing to support them in developing healthy relationships are significant, costly, and lifelong. If I take the case of bullying, we know bullying in childhood predicts delinquency, in teenagehood predicts unemployment, in in the 20s, it predicts low job status in the 30s, it predicts drug use in the 20s, and it predicts an unsuccessful life at 48. A relationship problem, if we don't address it, has significant long-term problems. Interesting, when we look at some of the main issues that face us as a society, 
bullying, violence, mental and physical health problems, substance use, school dropout, and unemployment are all outcomes that are rooted in experiences in violent relationships. That is, relationships, destructive, unhealthy relationships predict all of those outcomes. So why? Normally on this next section, I would spend two lectures. So that's about five and a half hours. The good news is I'm not going to keep you here for five and a half hours. I'm going to give you the version um, in, in about two minutes. Um, and it all has to do, and it's about why do, why do unhealthy relationships matter or why do they what happens in unhealthy relationships. And so I apologize for the expert neuroscientists who might be in the room in this explanation, but I want you to understand that unhealthy relationships, being in an unhealthy relationship, what I've termed relationship adversity, what we now know in the case of bullying as an example, is it causes children to go into a stress response. That is, and when you're in a stress response, and think about the last time you were a little bit worried about something and what it felt like, what happens? What happens is that you have a neurological response and you have a response at your molecular level, at an endocrine level. And what is happening is that these kids who are bullied, or, for example, or who live in homes with negative relationships or who have a negative relationship with the teacher, they experience this this stress response. And what happens in the stress response is it actually starts to affect the way that our brain functions and the way that we think. These children can't focus at school. These children, because it affects the attention part of their brain, these children can't um, emotionally regulate their behavior because it affects that area of the brain. Um, these children um, can't remember things because it affects the memory of, of the area of the brain. So it being in the chronic state of, of arousal, in this chronic state of stress, actually affects our brain's functioning. And over time, if this is repeated, it affects the structure of the brain. So it affects children's ability to do well at school, to succeed, and to learn the behaviors and the competency that they need to learn to be successful. It is not always about this stress response doesn't it happens in many kinds of relationships it can happen if you're abused and if you're neglected and in these extreme horrible kinds of situations but more importantly it's more likely to happen in the mundane day-to-day -day experiences that experience of living in that fear every day about going to school and that it leads to a chronic stress response so chronic stress response, my message is that it changes brain functioning and it changes brain structure over time. This is serious impact. The other thing that we've come to understand is it also changes the way that our genes regulate things. We also know that it changes what genes get turned on and off in certain kinds of environments. So it's almost like we have a gene environment interaction where our genes are in conversation with our social environment and our social environment can change what genes get turned on or off. It doesn't change the basic structure of our DNA, but it changes what gets turned on and off. The good news is that children are developing for many years, for 25 years. The brain develops for 25 years. We also know that in that conversation between the genes and the environment and between the brain and the social environment, we also know it can be changed. And that's the really positive news here, that we have a window of opportunity to change those potential negative effects on the brain and those negative effects on the genes. Um, and so it's, the good news is we can repair it. We have evidence to show that there are Different, in the bullying literature, we know that relationship-based interventions make a difference. We know that in other literature, that if you do improvement in, 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 in caregiving in early childhood, it can change that stress response, which can change that developing brain, and, and things can happen more positively for that individual. We know that individuals uh, who experience relationship problems and then they go into a positive daycare setting can change that stress response and can have more positive outcomes. We know that this is not just about intervening early, that when we intervene early, yes, that has many positive effects, but we know that relationship-based interventions at, in, in childhood, in adolescence, in late adolescence, make a difference on that stress response and make a difference on individuals' emotional functioning and physical and mental health well-being. We know that through research on adolescents. 
So what's my message here? My message here is that our challenge is to think about how we can, we can promote. What's our main mechanism of change? How can we promote health and well-being of our Canadian children and youth? By focusing on relationships, by changing the, and providing support for children to develop into a happy, in, for to children to develop um, happy, healthy relationships. And this will lead to a productive, competitive society. How do we do that? Well, we learn from the countries that are successful. If I take the example of bullying, what, you know, Canada ranks in the bottom half. What, who ranks in the top? The, the uh, countries like Scandin from Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and England are close to the bottom. What makes those countries unique on bullying? I'll tell you. They have a national strategy. They have a coordinated national strategy aimed at prevention and aimed at intervention. Second thing, the interventions are relationship-based. They focus on building relationships. In Norway, what do they do? They build a team among educators in Norway so that educators can support educators. And then they train those educators to support kids. And they create, uh, they are able to support children in developing healthy relationships. And they create student leaders to develop healthy relationships. And then they have a separate training for parents that do, does exactly the same thing and mirrors those skills. In Finland, they're focusing on the relationship skills of the peers as well. They're focusing on relationship-based intervention. So national strategies and focusing on relationships makes a difference. So what advice, what does this all mean for policy and what does this all mean for practice in Canada? I think in Canada we have one of the, we have an extraordinary group of researchers who have a lot to bring to the table. I think we need to close that science policy and science practice gap more successfully. If I was to deal with children's mental health and prevention of violence from a prevention campaign, and this, these would be my recommendations based on what we know in science. First thing, we need bullying, violence, and relationship, destructive and unhealthy relationships is a public health issue. We need to take a public health approach. We need a public health campaign with state-of-the-art, evidence-based, messaging. Second, we need to invest in parenting. The first relationships that children and youth experience are with parents. So we need to have initiatives and programs that are going to promote and support parents in developing the skills that they need to support high quality relationships. Third, all adults who interact with children and youth need to be trained in, in how do we promote and support healthy relationships. So not only do we need to put support the parents, but as children go through development, they go into childcare settings, they go into school settings, they go into after school settings, they're out in the neighborhood. All those adults need to be trained about uh, how to be supportive in relationships. Third, what we assess is what we value. That's what we, that's, and we need to do regular assessments on our children and youth social and emotional functioning to ensure that they're obtaining the level of development that we hope. So we need to do developmental assessments, relationship assessments, and we need to monitor, um, in part because we have an obligation to the UN under the children of, for child's rights. The third, the last thing that we need to do is we, from a prevention perspective, is we need to bridge that science policy program gap with a common research agenda and we need to get what we know in research out to the people who interact with children and youth every day and ensure that they have evidence-based in information. In Canada, we do a lot better at intervention. That is, we do a lot better at dealing with the problem. When I look at the number of things that we have, um, we have a lot of programs out to support or intervene with aggressive youth. That's the good news. But we need to do more. We need to do more on the prevention end so we have fewer people that we need to intervene in, and we need to do more when we intervene. The first thing is we know that the, the most at risk may be the most sensitive to change. The now research shows that those effects on the brain, those epigenetic effects, we know that those who are the most at risk actually are the most sensitive to change. That's the great news. With intensive, ongoing, supportive intervention for those children and youth, 
we can make a difference. So we need to target the most vulnerable communities. We need to target the most vulnerable youth who are at risk for developing those destructive relationships and unhealthy relationships. We need to intervene early. We need to be intensive and sustained service, continued monitoring over time. So what are my take home messages? My take home message first is that children develop healthy in the context of healthy relationships. Healthy relationships, if children have healthy relationships, they're gonna have healthy outcomes. Healthy relationships have an impact on all, on health throughout the lifespan, in infancy, in childhood, in middle childhood, in adolescence, and in adulthood, and in old age. If we invest in relationships, if we design our policies, programs, and initiatives in childhood and adolescence, we're gonna get huge economic returns as a society. We're gonna increase our ability for our youth to have school success. All types of relationship, parent, peer, school, teacher, neighborhood, all of those relationships were related to success at school. If we support them in those relationships and have relationship, we're gonna get the economic return of school success. We're gonna decrease criminality because remember, those behaviors are rooted in destructive relationships. We're gonna decrease health, justice, um, and, and the individual cost to society. We're going to increase well-being. We're going to decrease mental health problems. We're going to create a successful future labor force. We're going to have a future productive, cohesive Canadian society. We need to start now. We need to start investing in, in children's relationships. And ultimately, we as the adults of society are responsible for the quality of children's relationship. This is a call to action for us to take leadership and to do more to, sp to support the developing um, development of our children and youth. Healthy relationships, if we focus on them, it will promote health and it will prevent negative outcomes. Let's start today. Thank you. Turn it over for questions and answers. Um, je m'appelle Karen Cohen. Je suis la directrice générale de la Société canadienne de psychologie. I'm very glad to be here on behalf of the CPA to support the work of a psychologist like Dr. Craig, whose research helps to answer questions so fundamental to the success of Canada and indeed any society. We've heard about the one in five Canadians who experience a mental health problem and that the prevalence of mental disorders is particularly relevant to youth with 70% of mental disorders beginning before adulthood. People under 20 have the highest rates of depressive symptoms and those between 20 and 29, the highest rates of anxiety. The strongest evidence for return on investment in mental health involves services and supports that are geared to children and youth that reduce conduct disorders and depression, deliver parenting skills, as we've heard today, provide anti-bullying and anti-stigma education, promote health in schools, provide screening in primary health care settings for depression and alcohol misuse. We need to make sure that health promotion and prevention investments target services and supports for children and youth where return on investment indeed appears greatest. To paraphrase Dr. Craig, failing to protect and support children does indeed have consequences. Consequences in the life of a child, but also consequences for the society of which they're part. So thank you, Dr. Craig, for helping us to understand how Canada's future depends on the health and well-being of its youngest members, and thank you for giving us the information we need to do something about it. So we have uh, time for questions. Uh, if you'd like a, uh, to ask a question, there's a microphone in the center of the room. If you want to ask a question, don't hesitate to ask it in French or in English, as you want. But you can use the micro in the center of the room. And please identify yourself. So I'll get out of the way. And... Good morning. Uh, firstly, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, the work that you do and the messages that you bring, um, especially at a time now in the midst of things being as topical as they are, uh, mental health awareness, and we saw the tremendous success of Bell Let's Talk. Um, we think about things that doing for Darren. We think about um, the work in the community that Daniel Albertson does for mental health awareness. Um, I think it's wonderful what you're doing, and it's terrific to see at a place where I work in health 
Canada and my extension of Public Health Agency of Canada, that we have science-based evidence to move forward and to make change. My question to you, um, I know what it's like 100% to be bullied from grade 9 through grade 13. I'm living proof that you can come out of it and be successful. But it was tough. It was horrible. Um, I can also tell you, and I have no problem telling anyone here, that mixed into that was um, an undiagnosed uh, battle with mental health. So that was tough. So at that time, there was, and I'm not just, I'm not coming up here for any sympathy by any stretch. What I'd like to hear you <coughs> talk to you as a question is, I have a six-year-old daughter, and what would you tell me as a parent to this totally joy-driven child who's full of vim and vinegar? What would you recommend to me one key message as a parent, as a dad, who wants to protect her from the type of crap that I dealt with up here for so long? Well, I think as a dad, the most important thing is the quality of the relationship that you have with them. And we know that there are four key predictors. You know, one, warmth. Are you warm and affectionate and caring and loving with your child so that you create the climate that they can then disclose the things and the experiences that they have day to day? Responsivity. Are you responsive to your daughter? Are you aware of the signals that they have and do you respond to their needs that they when they need them? And can you interpret what they are? Um, the, the third one is monitoring. Do you know where your child, what, what are your child's relationships like? Who the child is hanging out with? Who the friends are? What are the quality of those relationships? Um, how well do you monitor your child? And then the last one, which as a parent is always the hardest one, is developing autonomy. We have to support our children and, and, and in their developing autonomy to allow them to become independent beings and to allow them to go out and experience that world. So. It, it's a bit of a mix where we're supportive and caring and then we let and we let them try them out and then we provide them feedback and then we continue to support them. So it's really those four things are really key predictors. The other predictor of uh, parenting or what pre uh, one of the things that's related to having positive social behavior outcomes in parenting is the ability of what we call of metacognition. I know it's like a psychology term, but it's our ability to think about our parenting, to, to think about how we're parenting our child, and so it's that reflection almost on how we parent and how we think about parenting and how we then think about what we're doing. And the parents who think more about their parenting and think more about what they're doing tend to have children who have uh, positive social behavior outcomes, or are more likely to. Art Eggleton, a uh, member of that uh, current controversial institution known as the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> In building relationships in the, in the modern era, uh, we find kids spending more time on electronic devices than ever before. With it. Instead of communicating face-to-face -face with many of their friends, they'll communicate by iPad, iPod, whatever, uh, and find themselves on electronic devices at home. And What do you do in this current situation to try to overcome uh, the challenges of building uh, relationships? Um, I think there's two. I do some work on the um, the social effects of, of engaging in, um, in in use of electronic media, and I think there's two things that I want to say. First of all, it's like anything, you know, boundaries and limits are positive. Uh, so it's about how much you you can have too much of a thing, and so it's about setting the appropriate boundaries. The second thing that we have to think a lot about is that electronics are here to stay, that they're part of the way we're going to socially interact and they're part of our children's social world, which makes it more challenging for those in my era because it wasn't part of mine. But it's finding that balance. The third thing that we need to know is it's what they do online that matters. Um, so, for example, that we know that boys in, in high school are much more likely to go on and do more isolated activities or activities that require less interaction like playing electronic games or gambling versus girls are much more likely to go on and do social activities and that's a more positive experience. So it's monitoring how long they're online, what they're doing online, um, and who they're with online. These are exactly the same skills that we have to think about in face-to-face -face parenting. 
Um, you know, we have to set limits, we have to know who the friends are, and we have to make sure that they're doing, engaging in appropriate behaviors. The last thing I'll say about online behaviors is, for some vulnerable youth, it's a positive experience and positively helps their, their, their development. So, for example, we know that children who are minority youth or part of a minority group uh, often go online and find a group that they can belong to. Um, and that gives them that fulfilling need of, of social acceptance. So it's about what they're doing online, who they're with online, and how long they're online. And parenting and quality parenting is about setting limits and boundaries around that. Hi there, Peter John Mitchell from the Institute of Marriage and Family. I was wondering if you could maybe expand for policymakers more on that idea of assessment and, and assessing uh, emotional uh, and uh, relational issues. What does that look like for a policymaker if they're trying to get their head around? I think one of the things that we need to do is have a social and emotional re uh, report card in Canada. So we need to know how well our kids are doing on their social relationships, how well they're doing on their social behaviors, how, w uh, how well they're doing at regulating their emotions, um, like learning the, the developmental milestones that they need to do. Like, are they regulating their anger appropriate? Are they um, engaging in conflict? Are they engaging... Um, in appropriate resolution of conflict? Do they, uh, are they engaging in aggressive kinds of behaviors? We need to understand how they're doing socially, how they're doing emotionally, and we need to know that at the different age groups. We need to know it from zero to five, then we need to know it for middle childhood, and then we need to know it for adolescents. Why do we need to know it? Because it tells us where we need to invest. It tells us when we assess something, we know what the problem is, so then we can put into place the interventions, the programs, and the policies to support that and to address that problem so that they won't have the long-term negative outcomes. So regular assessments are critical. The assessment should be developmental, and those assessments should assess. It's not only about physical injury. We now know social and emotional behaviors are absolutely critical, but we don't know enough about how Canadian children and youth are doing. Hi there, Robert South with Illinois Strategies. Thank you for a truly excellent presentation, Dr. Craig. Um, I have a question that just basically, uh, the opportunity presented itself today, so I'm going to take it. There was an article in McLean's Magazine maybe about a year ago on teenage girls and how a lot of what we in the adult world call bullying, they don't call bullying, they don't identify it as such, they call it drama and which tends to have a much more neutral term, just tends to present it as a conflict between two people as opposed to much more negative implications of bullying. Uh, I did do a survey on this, sample size of one, my 15-year-old uh, niece. <laughs> Admittedly, not scientifically valid, but uh, the article held up there, and I was just wondering if you'd seen the article, or even if you hadn't, if I could get sort of your reflections on sort of challenges, because you go around schools these days, and everywhere you see signs talking about speak out against bullying, this is a bullying free zone, all these sorts of things, but if kids aren't calling what's bullying, bullying, how, does, how do we address that part of the problem? So I think, thank you for asking that question. I think it's, a, it's about our public health education and our public health campaign. What we know is that girls and boys define bullying differently, um, and they define the behaviors that constitute bullying differently. So that drama, that gossiping, that excluding are behaviors that girls don't normally define as part of bullying. Well, it is a form of bullying if it's repeated and there's a power imbalance and there's an intention to harm. Interestingly, what we know about girls is they also define that as the most hurtful form of aggression that they can experience. So there's a gap between their cognitive beliefs or their interpretation of the behavior and their experience of the behavior. So that's why one of the first things that we need to do is do this education. We need a public education about what is bullying, why is bullying, you know, what are the negative effects of bullying, and that each of us can be, do something about it. And that's exactly it, to address that gap. Morning, Dr. Craig. Uh, I'm Heather Sams with SHIRT. Mine's a little bit off topic, but I know we're talking about children, but I'm just curious if any of your research um, touches on the children that are either victimized or are the actual bullies, if your research shows any stats when they're adults, what ends up happening? Because we also have adults in the same situation that are still victimized and still obviously doing the bullying. So I'm just curious uh, on that, please. Um, it, it's not my research, but it's others' research. 
and they have shown that there's intergen intergenerational continuity between bullying and victims. So children who, uh, adults who bullied as, chil as children are more likely to have children who bully. And it's exactly that epigenetic phenomenon and it's exactly that sort of brain development and structure that impairs their ability to create those relationships. It, 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 it interferes with what genes are being turned on and off and therefore it gets transmitted to the next generation. We, the, the intergenerational um, continuity of both bullying and victimization is, is quite high. So there is, there is continuity there um, between that. So there's, there, th that is an important issue to address because that speaks to how complex it is. It's about biology, but it's also about the social environment uh, that's around those people to help them develop the skills and the capacities to have a different trajectory. And if we intervene before 25, we can create a different trajectory for those children. That's the really important piece for you to take away. This is not predetermined, but we can actually create a change through changing social environments and relationships. Hi, Dr. Craig. Uh, thank you for speaking. Uh, I'm Jeremy from Chairs Vision and the International Day of Inc. I was hoping that you might comment on the criminalization of bullying. One of the things we've noticed in schools and communities is police officers are coming in and saying that if you sex, you'll go to jail, and if you bully, you'll get criminalized and punished for that. And uh, as a person who's in schools every day, we find that to be a disturbing trend, because as you mentioned, it's a relationship-based behavior, it's a public health issue. Um, what are your opinions on this criminalization of the municipal and provincial and federal level, um, and how can politicians move in a healthier direction? Um, uh, I think about children and youth as developing young beings. And so when development goes off track, when they engage in behaviors like bullying and victimization, what we need to do is think about what are the supports that we need to put them in, in place to help them develop what hasn't developed, whether it be that behavioral regulation, whether it be that moral um, development about, uh, whether it be the development of empathy, but we need to put those supports in place. And I think we know that, that locking youth up is not a deterrent. Because, and the reason it's not a deterrent is it doesn't give them alternative skills. It doesn't give them the skills and the competencies that they need to be different and to change. It doesn't provide them with the relationships that they need to be different and to change. And so I think we always have to think about how we can support the optimal development of children and youth. And we can support that by intervening in ways that are going to help them develop the competencies and capacities that they need to be successful. And I'm not that, that locking them up and, and criminalizing behaviors is not providing that kind of learning, that opportunity for them to be different. Bonjour, mon nom est Pierre Martel, je suis député de Longueuil, Pierre Boucher, dans le sud de Montréal, euh, en fait, la rive sud. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what's the, uh, the, uh, the, the most concrete rollout we can have of this concept that you bring in today? I mean, who's to take the reeling on this so that it does change something at the, at the very end? In my writing, there is so many poor people, so many poor, kid, poor kids. Um, I think, you know, I think there's two things that need to happen. The first thing that we need is the public health uh, initiative and the public health campaign. The second thing that we need to do is to identify vulnerable communities and put in proportionate resources for those universal interventions in those vulnerable communities. Because universal intervention makes a difference for all children, but some, tr some areas of our country will need more support will need are more vulnerable and we need to put more resources into those areas of the country if we do the assessments we can know what those areas of the country are and in fact uh, Clyde Hertzman the late Clyde Hertzman has done some of that work to identify where those parts are in our country and so I think we have to identify the vulnerable areas and communities in our country and we have to put in the resources to support relationships and parenting in that country and we need a broad public health campaign
Good morning, I'm Christine Trumpenstorff from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, targeted campaigns to address problems in public education and health uh, programs, but I wonder if you could talk in those countries that are doing better than Canada, what are some of the, what are some of the other things that are happening in those countries that are, are creating this environment in terms of education systems, health, uh, supports to families, etc.? I'm not sure I can fully answer that question, um, but uh, what I do know is that if we look at the countries, they're, they're more um, homogeneous kinds of countries, they're more socialist kinds of countries um, that probably reflect that broader uh, system. I think what's really important is that these countries are responding to what the impetus in each of the countries that have the national campaign was a response to a tragic event. Um, that, that So a whole country galvanized and created um, a national policy. They created a national unity sort of uh, about how the ministers of education would work together across the country in the different areas of the country. So they created that mechanism. They invited health officials into that talk. So there was cross-disciplinary kind of talk about how to support children and youth. The messages that came out from, the, from a public health perspective um, were interdisciplinary, so they were about taking good care of yourself. They were also about creating those healthy relationships and how to. So I think it was a much more holistic sort of approach that crossed different sectors. Sorry, that's what academics do. We move our hands around a lot. Um, that cross different sectors of, of society, and I think it's that kind of unified global approach that will make a difference. And being interdisciplinary means we can reach into more different places and involve more different players. So I'm not sure if that fully answers. Hello, my name is uh, Alana Fast from the Council of Canadian Academies. Um, two things. The first was when you listed all the relationships. I didn't see relationships with siblings there, and I wondered how much, how important that is, because I would imagine quite important. And the second thing is, um, I wonder how much compensation there is. Um, for example, if you have a bad relationship with a teacher, does a good relationship with your friends compensate for that? And if, if there are compensations, which are the most important relationships for us to focus on in terms of policy? Uh, two great questions. Um, first of all, yes, relationships are, with SIBs are really important. We don't have that data in the Canadian Health Behavior Survey of Children and Youth, so I, I can't report on that. But they are. Other research very clearly shows that. Um, and then the other second thing is, yes, you know, one healthy relationship with an adult can buffer children from having negative effects of those adverse relationships. And so, so there, there is. We don't know the complex interaction among all those different relationships, but we know that there's a cumulative effect. So that is, the more healthy relationships you have, the increased uh, health that you have. The other thing that we know is that there are, are constant things across those quality of relationships that matter, and they were the things that I talked about it. Support, warmth, um, at developing autonomy, um, and, and monitoring. All of those things characterize the high quality relationships across all those relationships. So the more healthy relationships you have, the better it is. Yes, a healthy relationship can provide a protective buffer against an adverse relationship. And an example is Mar Mara Bregman did some really nice work where high risk children went to school and they had high risk. She looked at their uh, genetic makeup and they were at high risk for aggressive behavior. Kids who had a caring, supportive teacher were let much less likely to be aggressive. And at an epigenetic level, it actually turned off some of those genes associated with aggressive behavior. So a positive adult can influence that conversation between our biology and our environment is really important. I mean, I'll, I'll speak for me. I'm not more than the Federation of the Canada is a federal state. And the examples of good performers, uh, United States. What would what be the division of labor, in your, from your perspective, from the federal government vis-à-vis -vis provinces? 
Uh, that's a great question. So I think there are two things that can happen. I think that the federal government can take a leadership on the public health education and the public health campaign. I think the federal government can take leadership on a coordination activity. So we have in Canada a joint consortium of school health where the, all the ministers of education come together and that's supported by the federal government. It's through that mechanism that they can support a coordinated role to allow the provinces to roll out what they need to roll out in education. There's also a role for uh, health and the ministries of health across the country who are also part of that joint consortium. So I think uh, the feds need to take leadership on the public health initiative, on the monitoring, and on a coordination role. I think the, the provinces need to take leadership on the rollout in, through education and through sort of some specific health initiatives. We have time for one more question, if anyone... Well, I have one question that you've got. <laughs> Just as I thought I was off. You sort of hinted at it already in looking at some of the um, countries that are doing, uh, uh, doing well in terms of uh, intervention for prevention. Uh, in addition to being uh, uh, unitary states or non-federal states, um, some of those societies are more, much more homogeneous than yes. Canada is. And so how does the reality of Canadian, Canadian diversity play into the challenges around uh, uh, early intervention to, prevent, uh, to, promote, to promote effective social relationships? That's a really great question. And, you know, in fact, we've done, there's some work, when you look at some of the programs uh, that have been implemented at a national level to prevent bullying, for example, in Norway, when they've been taken and uptaken into, into the states and into Canada, they don't have as a large effect size. They're not as effective as they are. And, and the thinking is because they aren't, um, because it is a more homogeneous society. And I think that's where we, at Canadian research, can play a real role. We have unbelievable talent of researchers in the area of aggression and violence in our country. And in fact, is one of the strongest in the world, I would argue, um, who have developed this. And we need to you know, we who have developed intervention and prevention programs that are Canadian grown through Canadian research and we need to work on, part of the problem is that these Canadian programs aren't well distributed throughout the country. They aren't well disseminated. So we have evidence-based, Canadian-based programs that uh, are very localized and not well disseminated. And so here's another role for the federal government is, you know, how can we create, and they have the best practice portal, uh, and, and advertise where people can go to get a program that's evidence-based, that's effective, that will work for them, that deals with these different types of relationships. And we need to get that out. And that's bridging the, the science practice one. We need to disseminate evidence-based programs out there. And we have many that can deal with the heterogeneity of our society that are based in Canada and made and, and developed in Canada. Just before uh, inviting you all to, to uh, join me in thanking Wendy, I want to point out that the reason why we're able to have the Big Thinking Breakfast here in this wonderful location is thanks to uh, Michael Chong, the MP for Wellington Holton Hills. Unfortunately, Michael uh, was uh, pulled away uh, for other business at the last moment and couldn't be here this morning. Uh, but on his behalf and on behalf of the Federation, Wendy, I just want to offer you a little token of uh, our appreciation and ask uh, everyone in the room to join me in thanking Wendy for what was really a terrific <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, early uh, in the morning and, and for what I think was also a, a fantastic question and answer period. For those of you who have uh, colleagues who might be interested in this topic, uh, just to point out that we will be uh, um, uh, video casting and webcasting the, uh, uh, this morning's presentation on the Federation uh, website, which is www.ideas-idea.ca. The cards are all on your, uh, on your table, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, and je voudrais vous inviter à notre prochaine conférence uh, Wild Ground qui aura lieu le 21 mars. Stéphane Bouchard, uh, qui vient de l'Université du Québec uh, uh, en Outaouais, will explore the relationship uh, or the possibilities of technology in treating mental illness, which is actually a nice segue from uh, this morning's uh, uh, this morning's lecture. 
And I guess uh, on a day which uh, symbolically at least is one that we're supposed to be focusing on relationships, uh, Wendy has given us a lot to think about in terms of the importance of strong relationships with uh, the youngest members of our society uh, in addition to everyone else. So again, thank you very much Wendy for a great talk. Thank you.